Hey, man, are we recording? Yeah, we've been recording for a while. Yeah. I'm so sorry I'm late, man. I, um, As you know, we've got pigs here at the house, and uh, my wife is out of town. I yeah, two pigs. pigs. Two pigs, yeah, two pigs how's in life, the backyard. How's life with two pigs? We got two pigs, two dogs, two guinea pigs. Um, my wife also has a donkey, a zonkey, and three horses. So uh, mm -hmm. we're contributing to the uh, livestock and animal husbandry uh, you're basically industry. Basically, living in a zoo. Essentially, essentially yeah. living in a zoo. Well, and, you know, part of me is like, that's cool. Yeah. Because look at you, you know, one with nature, and right? Surrounding yourself with. Uh, made up animals like zonkeys, which we all know is <laughs> fake. There's no such thing. Genetic um, engineering. At the same time, like, is that a is that a good idea? Is that like a good idea to have you know a bunch of animals living in the in a kind of urban environment? I mean, what do they eat? Like Doritos and stuff? No, they eat animal mush. I think it's good. It makes me feel at one with nature. Although you're right. I mean, there are some moral questions. It's like, is this really the very best place for these pigs to be living? I mean, it's certainly better than a than a bacon farm, you know, in Nebraska. <laughs> I guess but that's uh, a good does, point. But do you do you have animals or you you've got livestock well, or what do you have? This is the thing. Like, yeah, we have we have uh, we have chickens. Uh, but you know. I kind of the reason I'm asking this is because I, I sort of went underwent a kind of a moral quandary myself. My wife and I, who are big bee lovers, right? We're, we're very stressed out about you know a possible future without bees, which I guess is a very real possibility. And so we had this idea, as stupid people do, where we thought, well, maybe we can you know control the the problem. In some way, we can, uh, you know, benefit the bee population. We'll raise our own bees. So, like, we literally went out there, like, we got a big hive, and we put it all together, and we got all the equipment. We don't know shit about bees, but we read a book. Um, and went out and got uh, 12,000 bees that we had every intention of, you know, of caring for and, and raising and, like, you know, helping to boost uh, the, the world. I have so many population. questions about the twelve thousand bees. Did you interview them? We did. We we well, we're only going to take like the best bees. Like we're not going to take subpar bees. How do you right? know you had twelve thousand bees? You... How did you know it's not like three thousand seven hundred bees? And why do they come in batches of twelve thousand? We were just told there were twelve thousand in the in the box, and I guess we just took the guy's word for it. You know, it's not like in those movies where like they give you the money and and you're like, I'm just going to count this real quick. That's one bee. <laughs> two bees. That's like the Three. population of Olympia, Washington. Well, we ended up accidentally killing the population of Olympia, Washington. Like that's the moral of this story is that everything that we tried to do, we actually ended up having our colony collapse. So like we far from trying to save the bees, we <laughs> we took part in their inevitable destruction. Oh my god, that's terrible. I know. Bee killer. I'm about bee kill, but this is the problem, right? Like when you when you insert yourself into nature, it doesn't matter whether you have like you know the best of intentions, which we did. Uh, you know, chances are because we're humans and we're fucking morons that we're gonna screw it up in in some way. That's why I'm worried about your pigs, is what I'm trying to say. Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake, the show where we go deep, we get weird, and we search for the meaning of life along the way. Presented by Cast Media and Soul Pancake. My pigs are fine. I'm not going to kill my pigs and I'm not going to let harm come to them. But, uh, you know, this this issue, man's harmony with nature, man changing nature, controlling nature, is at the heart of a new book uh, written by Elizabeth Colbert. Uh, she's the author of... Uh, Field Notes from a Catastrophe, Man, Nature, and Climate Change. She won the Pulitzer just a couple of years ago for her book, The Sixth Extinction. Great book. And she's got a new book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. So I'm so excited to talk to her about what the nature of the future actually is. Yeah, uh, the book is about how maybe the answer to dealing with our catastrophic attempts to control nature is more control of nature, <laughs> which brings up all kinds of, you know, issues. Like, is this the right thing to do? I mean, how can you trust human beings? Are we just going to kill the bees that we're trying to to save? And, but, you know, it's an important question. You and I, we, you and I 
take you know the environment seriously we try our best to be good stewards of the earth but yes it does it mean something different now to be a steward of the earth so many so many questions to ask elizabeth colbert she's a staff writer at the new yorker she's received two national magazine awards uh, and as you mentioned, the Pulitzer, which um, I guess is an important award. I've it's a never little important. received one. But you know, this issue is not as cut and dry as like, oh, let's be good to planet Earth. We've already no. taken it up to the brink and we've meddled with it so very much, like Reza and his bees. Uh, it becomes a very complicated, variegated, nuanced, uh, and incredibly relevant discussion. I can't wait to dig into this. Our guest today is Elizabeth Colbert. Elizabeth Colbert, thank you so much for um, joining us on Metaphysical Milkshake. You know, Rain and I are big fans of yours. We both absolutely loved The Sixth Extinction, your uh, previous book. I have to say, I can't wait for the sequel, The Seventh Extinction. It's going to be amazing. (laughs) What was great about that book, it was like this deep dive into um, the uh, the so-called anthropocene, anthrop- 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 anthropocene. I think anthro- anthropocene. An- anthropocene. Anthrop- anthropo- anthropocene. Yeah, it's pronounced differently depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. Actually, what is it on our side of the Atlantic? It's usually pronounced the anthropocene on our side of the Atlantic. But if I wanted to be like fancy and British and sound smart, what would I say? You'd say anthropocene. For our more ignorant listeners. And you know who you are. You all know exactly who you are. Explain to us what exactly is the Anthropocene era. Technically, it's an epoch, not an era. And geologists are very are very persnickety about their geological time periods. And the Anthropocene would, and people do debate, we can talk about this, um, in when exactly it started. Some people say with the start of the Industrial Revolution. Some people would say much more recently, more like um, when we started dropping, you know, doing above ground nuclear testing. Um, but it represents this idea that we have entered a new geological time period where humans are the or a dominant geological force. As in like we're we're like uh, exerting our will over the planet. Yes, I mean, a lot of it we didn't do consciously. For example, um, you know, changing the climate, we didn't really set out to do that, but we did it anyway. And we're affecting all aspects of nature, uh, climate, geology, biology, weather, Yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of, you know, astonishing statistics that suggest that we have become a very dominant force. For example, humans, you know, with our bulldozers and et cetera, we move around as much earth and sediment as all of the world's major rivers, which, you know, is a huge geological force. So that's, that's just one, uh, you know, one measure of our, of our impact. We, In our fertilizer plants, we produce as much, we fix as much nitrogen. And it's a little bit technical. We're not going to go into exactly what nitrogen fixing is, but we fix as much nitrogen as all terrestrial ecosystems combined. So, you know, the list kind of goes on and on. These are pretty, pretty big deals. We emit a hundred times more CO2 every, every year than volcanoes do. And volcanoes used to be the major you know, outputters of of CO2 into the atmosphere. So these are just some of the ways that we are now have have become um, the prevailing force on planet Earth. And I just tweeted the other day that I read that one out of every three in your book, I read one out (laughs) of every three CO2 molecules in the atmosphere was put there by humans. Yes, exactly. That's another indicator. Yeah. I realized that I did not credit you in my tweet, and I apologize for that. I forgive you. But we are going to give this book such Twitter love, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. I loved it. I thought it was fascinating. I loved every story, every example. I want you to talk to us about the book, and then we'll get into some of the kind of bigger, meatier questions that underlie what the book is about. But one of the ironies of the Anthropocene is how often humans, they— try and fix one ecological problem, and then they invite a new one. And this happens time and time again. And in this incredibly well-traveled, researched book, you go from example to example to example. Um, We were hoping you could start with the one around the 
the Chicago River and the Ship Canal and Lake Michigan, because it it opens up so many questions and issues. Yeah, sure. So that's that's a very very vivid one. And as you say, it it opens up the book to give the short version. What happened was Chicago grew up along the Chicago River. Anyone who's been to Chicago knows that. Um, it's sort of a, you know, it's a modest river, but um, it's key to the city's history because the city used it to dispose of all of its waste as it was growing up, all of its human waste. And then as the incredible stockyards of Chicago grew up, all of its, all of the waste from the stockyards. And so the river, um, it was said that the river was so thick with filth that a, a chicken could walk across it without ever getting <laughs> its feet wet. Um, so it was, you know, so this was a, you know, this was just gross, but beyond being just gross, um, it was a real public health hazard because the river was flowing east into Lake Michigan and Chicago was also drawing its drinking water. It still draws its drinking water from Lake Michigan. So you, you can kind of do the math on that. So toward around the turn of the 20th century, Chicago decided to do something about this problem. And what it decided to do was to actually reverse the flow of the Chicago River. And this was one of the biggest construction projects of its era. And it involved digging this canal, the, sh- the sanitary and ship canal, that then connected the Chicago River. So instead of flowing into the Great Lakes, it was now flowing into the Mississippi drainage basin. And so now Chicago's waste was flowing west and ultimately ending up actually in the Gulf of Mexico. Problem solved. Everybody was happy. Thank you, Elizabeth. It was wonderful to have you on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. No, it's true that the Missourians were not, were not happy about, about this at all to think of being, you know, Chicago's waste flowing past it. Um, But that's what happened. Chicago did it when it opened the canal uh, there was a headline in the New York Times, and I, I'm not getting exactly right, but it was something like uh, water in the Chicago River resembles liquid again. I mean, it was it was a joke, basically. So so Chicago does this despite, you know, Missourians complaints. Um, and what no one has really thought that much about is now we have connected these two great drainage basins, the Great Lakes Drainage Basin and the Mississippi Drainage Basin, which previously were separate. Not very separate, you know, you could walk from one to the other, but if you were aquatic, you couldn't get in to, you couldn't move from one basin to the other. And over the course of the 20th century, both the Mississippi Basin and the Great Lakes Basin became highly invaded ecosystems. And so all sorts of species wreaking all sorts of havoc on in both basins. And then you got also this ability to cross from one to the other. So around the turn of the 20th century, it was decided, uh uh-oh, you know, this is a bad idea. So after having reversed the Chicago River, now part of the river is electrified to try to keep these species on their respective sides of what used to be this great divide. And part two of your book, those species are there's algae clogging the rivers of the Mississippi Basin. So they bring in Asian carp, four different species, to eat the algae. And this is the most invasive fish in the history of the planet Earth. And they're terrified that the Asian carp is going to make its way up the Mississippi, through all the little tributaries, to the Chicago River, up into Lake Michigan, and essentially, like like seven Chinese brothers swallowing the ocean, uh, just destroy the ecosystem of the Great Lakes. Yeah, exactly. So these these electric barriers are supposed to be keeping Asian carp from moving from the Mississippi system, which, as you say, they've really taken over, you know, um, into the Great Lakes. And, you know, no one really is confident. No one really wants to rely on that. So they're actually the Army Corps of Engineers is planning another series of barriers that would have bubbles and noise. It was described to me as a disco barrier, um, a sort of supplemental set of barriers that would be built further, I guess, south, you would say, so sort of downriver uh, to try to dissuade the fish uh, that much more. Um, but, you know, all of these are obviously um, somewhat ad hoc stopgap measures. 
Rain, you and I, huge Star Wars fans, right? Am I right? It's true. None bigger. And that's why I am wearing my fandom with pride with my new Star Wars rings from Enso Rings. These are the coolest silicone rings I've ever seen. The designs are amazing. They feel great on. I've got five of them on my hand right now because that's how I roll. You know, where I first saw these Enso rings was at a Comic-Con. I love going to Comic-Cons and uh, I saw kind of the hippest of nerds wearing Enso rings and I realized rings don't need to be made out of metal. Yeah, especially if you're a writer like me, you can't have a big heavy metal thing on your fingers. I love these things. They're so lightweight. They're so cool. And there's six of them. I've got right now on my hand, the Mandalorian on my thumb. I got Darth Vader in my first finger. I got Grogu in my middle finger, R2-D2 right here, and my ring finger, C-3PO, and even... I got an extra one here for the Stormtrooper. They're all made in the USA at their facility in Utah. You can choose your favorite or do what I did. Buy them all together in a limited edition collector's box. Trust us, you're going to love the Star Wars collection from Enso Rings 2. Don't miss out. Order yours today. Go to EnsoRings.com. That's E-N-S-O Rings.com. Get free shipping with the code Star Wars. That's Star Wars. Remember, EnsoRings.com. Hey, Rain, fun fact. Did you know the first oranges weren't orange? They were green. What? Another fun fact for you. Did you know the letter Q doesn't appear in the name of any state in the United States? Yeah, what about Minnequota? I got a personal fun fact. Did you know that I'm not wearing pants right now? That's disgusting. But I also have a personal fun fact, and this is for real. I have an extra rib. Uh, uh... Here's a not so fun fact. Americans overspend on insurance by $21 billion every year. And you, my friends, deserve all the facts. And that's where the Zebra can help you. The Zebra compares car and home insurance quotes from every major provider in under five minutes, giving you all the facts you need to make the right decision for you all for free. It's the fastest way to find the right coverage at the right price, all from a provider you can trust. In fact, The Zebra saves shoppers an average of $922 on home and car insurance combined. And that is a very fun fact. Let me tell you, I could have used the Zebra when uh, I was on our family RV trip and broken down in the middle of nowhere for two days. But it's not too late now. You can get all the facts in one place. Start comparing quotes for free today by visiting thezebra.com slash milkshake. That's the Zebra dot com slash milkshake. So just to be clear, we fucked up the Chicago River and rather than actually stop fucking it up, we just reversed the course of the river. Uh, but then that created another problem, which is all these weeds and algaes that got in the way of the of the boats, like Rain was saying. And so We had to deal with the weeds and the algae, so we thought, oh, we'll just throw some Asian carp in there. They'll eat the weed and the algae. That took care of the weed and the algae, but now we have all these Asian carp, and so we have to figure out what to do about the Asian carp. So the answer was, let's just (laughs) electrify the river. And this becomes essentially the theme of Under a White Sky, which is that throughout much of human history, uh, as as you rightly say in the Anthropocene era, which is how I say it, Rain. Well said. Epoch. I'm sorry. Did I say era? I don't want to... Please don't send me emails, people. The story of of humanity has precisely been this like attempt to impose our will and to control nature. And then that has had, obviously, these devastating consequences. This control of nature you um, is both described as bioengineering and geoengineering. Can you give the listeners a description of those two concepts? Well, no. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure exactly what you mean. I have to be frank. I mean, I mean. Well, I like the cane toads are being bioengineered through CRISPR to be less poisonous. Okay, genetic, genetic, genetically engineered. But I would say anything that has to do with changing the biology of something would be bioengineered. I, what do I know? I'm a, I'm a dumb, I'm a sitcom actor. But geoengineering being like the, the, what you end the book on and the title of the book, Under a White Sky, the option to help curtail for a limited amount of time Uh, the effects of climate change by putting some kind of reflective aerosol in the atmosphere that would be more um, 
uh, I guess, geo, just because it has to do with uh, Earth and uh, temperatures and uh, climate and non-living species. Yes, exactly. That has that is called that's called geoengineering. I mean, it, or it's called somewhat more soothingly. It's sometimes called solar radiation management. Um, so yes, we we can we have now you know we have a capacity, or at least in theory, to rewrite um, the biology of the planet using technologies like CRISPR, so to just gene edit, gene edit, we could gene edit ourselves, theoretically, not, probably not, uh, those of us who are already, you know, grown, but our, our kids, and uh, we can gene edit, you know, theoretically, again, just about everything on Earth. Um, and we also have the capacity to transform the stratosphere. Once again, at least in theory, we could um as you were alluding to, the idea behind, you know, solar geoengineering is we would shoot some kind of reflective stuff into the stratosphere and, you know, control the climate that way. I feel like I've seen this movie. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it never works out. That movie usually stars Gerard Butler. Yeah, it's always Gerard Butler. And ends with the death of like hundreds of millions of people. But not Gerard. And that's the important he thing. He survives. He's he a survivor. Survives. Have there been any successes? I mean, you go around the world and, and there's these nightmare scenarios of mankind meddling with species and importing creatures and plants and, and moving rivers and uh, affecting the atmosphere. And it's just, it's just pretty awful. Has humanity ever successfully done bio or geoengineering? Well, I mean, I, th I think the question is, you know, successfully for whom, I guess, is the question, right? Or what? I mean, you know, yeah, look, of course, we've, we've completely transformed the world. And there's, you know, more people on the planet than ever before. So on some level, we've been, you know, just extraordinarily successful. Um, agriculture, you mm. know, feeds, you know, 7.8 billion people, some a lot better than others. But, you know, uh, that's a lot of people and a lot more people than would have ever been on the planet before. So it's been an incredibly successful project. That's exactly, you know, why we're in the Anthropocene, um, you know, but in the process, you know, even, you know, take agriculture, which you could say is a, you know, pretty big deal um, and, and feeds us all. Well, something was, you know, displaced in, in the process of that. It's been, you know, very good for humanity, but it, it hasn't been so good for anything that lived in that, you know, forest that got cut down so we could plant soy or corn or whatever the hell it is. So, you know, you do have to ask the question, whose, pers whose perspective are you taking? In some ways, this comes to the, the heart of the matter, right? Which is, and Rain and I talk about this all the time because it stresses us out as people who are, you know, environmentally conscious. And the, this larger question of, is it just too late? Is it just too late to do anything about the environment? I mean, is it too late to slow down climate change? Is it too late to kind of reverse um, the, the destruction that we have wrought on our planet? Um, and is it just time to kind of get used to uh, this future that's about to come? So in other words, are we are we putting all of our resources into trying to stop a problem that is no longer stoppable instead of uh, focusing on making us more likely to survive this future <laughs> that is about to come? And if I feel like, in many ways, you fall into that latter category, right? Because, I mean, one of the things that you do write about in this book is the the attempt by people not to um, slow down climate change, but to radically alter, uh, you know, the the very sort of nature of our of our planet in order to, you know, fix an what is now a kind of an unfixable problem. It's too late to undo the climate change we've already accomplished, which is, you know, a significant amount of climate change. Um, you know, we've already probably raised average global temperatures by, you know, roughly two degrees Fahrenheit. That's, you know, nothing to sneeze at. And we're seeing all sorts of sorts of impacts. And the only way we could, you know, fix that or reverse that is to do something like geoengineering. Um, 
But, you know, there's a difference between throwing up our hands. And I mean, I'll take the example of climate change because I think it's kind of top of mind for a lot of people right now, though, although it's not the only issue I talk about in the book. Um, you know, there's there's like, you know, bad outcomes and then there's, you know, disastrous, you know, billions killed outcomes. <laughs> and, and we still do have a choice here and we still have a lot of choices. So um, there's a kind of a a saying in, you know, climate circles, if such things exist, that what we need to do is, you know, manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. And that is still, you know, possible, but it gets more and more difficult every day that goes by as we just continue to pour CO2 into the atmosphere. So I feel that if you boil all of this down, it comes down to the book of Genesis from the Bible, which is man shall have dominion over nature and subdue the creatures and subdue mm-hmm. subdue the earth something like that i'm 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 vaguely misquoting but god did a better job when he said it yeah what would it have been like if in the book of genesis it had said like if man shall be caretakers of the earth or stewards of the growth of nature or you know because, but this idea of dominion and and subduing you know yeah was probably super important for humanity when we were starting out. You know, the first couple of millennia on this planet, we needed to dominate, we needed to subdue in order to survive. We probably couldn't have done it otherwise. However, that way of looking at our relationship with nature, which uh, according to a lot of people have been kind of divinely prescribed, has really gotten us here, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Isn't isn't this about a complete and total overhaul and reimagination about our relationship of, of not being over nature, but part of nature? Well, I mean, I don't know if we needed, you know, um, Genesis to set us on this path. How's that? Um, but, uh, you know, I think that one of the problems, and it's a pretty profound problem, and this is the problem I would really say at the heart of of my book, is, you know, it's it's nice to say in 2021, well, we really ought to start living in harmony with nature, but it's living not in harmony with nature. That has allowed us to be, you know, 7.8 billion going very rapidly on 7.9 billion people. And it's not something that you can suddenly say, oh, we really ought to, you know, go back to a way we lived, you know, either pre-Genesis or whatever past you want to look back toward where humans were much less of a force on planet Earth. There were a lot, lot fewer of us. And they didn't, you know, so so we didn't, you know, it's pre-agriculture. We didn't have to... uh, feed and clothe and house, you know, a lot of people and a lot of people who should be fed and housed and clothed better than they are now, you know, so, so we have a pretty big, um, we're not really in a position to go, you know, it's nice to talk and sort of hand wave about living in harmony with nature, but it's not clear to me exactly how modern uh, industrialized society upon which billions of people depend can do that. Ladies and gentlemen, and I'm speaking mostly to the gentlemen, this episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Say it with us, Blue Chew. It's fun how it rolls off the lips. That's what she said. Blue Chew is making waves and bringing more confidence to the bedroom by offering chewable tablets that can help men get stronger and longer lasting erections. Who doesn't want stronger and longer lasting erections? Answer, nobody doesn't want that. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form. And at a fraction of the cost. Blue Chew's tablets help men achieve harder, stronger erections, and it combats all forms of ED. That's erectile dysfunction for those of you who are not in the know. Blue Chew is an online prescription service, so there's no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy, and it ships right to your door in a discreet little package. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform... 
Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And here is a special deal for our listeners. Try BlueChew free when you use our promo code MILKSHAKE at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com promo code MILKSHAKE to receive your first month free. And we thank BlueChew for sponsoring our podcast. This podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. Listeners, is there something interfering with your happiness or is something preventing you from achieving your goals? Uh, Yeah, yeah. Lots and lots of things. Why do you ask, Rain? Well, listen, um, mental health is something that I've spoken a lot about. It's something really important to me. And a lot of time what gets in the way is anxiety, depression. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. This is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today, Reza. Wow. Okay. Well, then, so visit betterhelp.com slash milkshake. That's better H-E-L-P and join the over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're now recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. There's a special offer for Metaphysical Milkshake listeners, so listen up. You get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp if you use the code MILKSHAKE. So that's betterhelp.com slash milkshake. So, Elizabeth, can I call you Elizabeth? You may. Elizabeth. Can I call you Betty? <laughs> no? What is, what is your preferred nickname? Betsy. I don't, don't want to say it's my preferred nickname, but it's what people call me. All right, Betsy, listen up. When I was a kid, I religiously watched Star Trek. About, there's about seven or eight episodes where they beam down to a planet to find these bucolic people living in harmony with nature, tilling the soil, having animals, you know, picking fruits and wearing togas or or what, or or frocks or burlap sacks or something like that. And then, and then, but they're getting weird readings or whatnot, and they go behind the scenes and they find like, all this technology, like under the grass mat of their hut is like computers. And and we realized that like back in the day, they used to uh, have all of this technology, but it brought them to the brink of war or disaster or ruined their planet or environment or, or what have you. And now they've kind of set that beside them, behind them, and they're choosing to live a different kind of you know, peaceful agrarian lifestyle or something like that. And I love those episodes. In reading your book, that's what it made me think about. Because I, I thought about what, in, in another gigantic question that underlies your work is like, where are we headed? We're certainly headed for an ecological and environmental catastrophe with climate change and, and its uh, ensuing uh, repercussions. But uh, where where does humanity go 200 years from now, 500 years from now. I know this is, you're a reporter and you haven't been there and seen it and interviewed the folks, but asking you also as a thinker in this realm, like, where do you see us going? Do you see us potentially being like one of those Star Trek civilizations? You know, I don't see us doing that willingly, although, you know, many, there are many narratives that, um, you know, which are fairly utopian, Star Trek as utopian narrative. But it's quite possible that we'll get there, you know, somewhat, you know, kicking and screaming. I think that is quite possible. I guess the problem and the and the worry is, you know, what happens between here and there. So I'll, I'll give you another, you know, example. Several billion people are now alive, you know, the three of us, let's just put it that way, and many billions of others because of synthetic fertilizers, which were invented in the right around the start of World War One, and now feed, you know, two or three billion people. So you could say, well, let's, let's go back, you know, let's go back to that bucolic moment when we were, you know, picking fruit and before. But that required, you know, if you go back to the era before synthetic fertilizers, you know, that consigns a lot of people to starvation. So, you know, we're obviously not doing that willingly. And I I honestly don't think we should do that willingly. But 
you know, will we get to a point where the current way of doing things is is unsustainable and in in some either, you know, slow or fast way that's made apparent to us? I, I do think that's quite possible when you look out, you know, over the horizon of, you know, what we would consider the sort of foreseeable future. But a lot of it, I do want to say, to not be too sort of nihilistic, a lot of it does depend on choices that are being made right now. I can't say I see them being made particularly well, but they could be made better. Well, okay. Well, that's an interesting point because you actually do touch on this in the book, which is, okay, so if we have the ability to um, fix our damaging control over nature by controlling nature a little bit more, uh, well, what, what, ought we to save, you know, like right at this moment, like, what do you think um, we need to focus on first and foremost and, and sort of what are the moral and ethical implications of choosing, you know, one species over another or choosing one, you know, focus over another? You know, like step one would obviously be like, you know, global ethics for dummies or whatever, you know, step one would obviously be for, certainly for very wealthy countries like our own to, um, you know, really dramatically reduce their carbon emissions and probably really dramatically reduce our consumption of all kinds. You know, we're just consuming way, way more. And if everyone on the planet consumed at the level that we do, you know, we would have already hit that wall uh, decades ago. So, you know, if you, if you realize that sort of what you're doing, if universalized, would be completely unsustainable, then then you kind of have a responsibility, it seems to me, to reevaluate that. Now that, you know, we're going to see some of these issues play out even over the next couple of years or maybe over the next couple of months, you know, is there going to be any climate change um, legislation passed by the U.S. Congress? You know, are we going to see things that actually impinge on people's lives in any way? Or is that just politically so toxic, you know, that that's not going to happen? Um, I don't know the answer to that. It's actually a pretty interesting moment um, to see where things are heading. Rain, this reminds me of that thing you were saying um, a while ago about how the word environmentalism, uh, like the definition of it is changed now. Right. I mean, it used to mean like environmentalist was somebody who was focused on preventing climate change. And maybe now like an environmentalist is somebody who promotes like active reversal. The environmental movement really started with author Rachel Carson and her book Silent Spring. And uh, she was like the grandmama environmentalist, you know, in terms of an activist environmentalist. And uh, yeah, you're right. Back then, 60s, 70s. 80s even, environmentalism was about preserving what's there. Let's save the redwoods, let's save the whales, let's stop uh, you know, construction, bulldozing forests, or what have you. Um, but with increased control uh, you know, enacted by humanity time and time again, uh, I think environmentalism needs a redefinition. Rachel Carson said, the control of nature is a phrase conceived in arrogance, born of the Neanderthal age, there's that word Neanderthal again, of biology and philosophy, when it was supposed that nature exists for the convenience of man. But I would say, Rachel, 2021, we have to redefine environmentalism. We have to do whatever we can. And this may require us using CRISPR on various animal species. Um, it may involve us like genetically modifying and breeding coral to save coral. It may involve us spraying an aerosol in the stratosphere to reflect heat and give us another like 10 years to kind of get our shit together down on planet Earth. Being an environmentalist might mean being uh, undertaking um, increased control. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, no, this is a huge, I mean, you have identified a huge sort of schism, I suppose, in the environmental movement. And increasingly, you know, there are all sorts of, of wheels and subwheels here, you know, I mean, for example, for, for a long time, it was considered to be um, 
you know, not a, not a good idea to talk about ways that, that we were going to adapt to climate change. You know, let's not talk about how we're going to adapt to climate change because that just is going to prevent people from focusing on what we really need to do, which is stop emitting and try to minimize climate change. Well, now too late. that argument isn't happening anymore because it's very clear we're going to be having to adapt to climate change. Exactly. We have to try to minimize climate change, but we also have to adapt because so much climate change is already baked into the system. So all these debates, things are sort of creeping along and climate change is a real challenge to a lot of the, you know, basic tenets of the environmental, you know, classic sort of environmental movement, because you can't keep things the same. Even if you, you know, walled off part of the world and said, let's, this is a habitat for, you know, X, and we're going to just not touch it, no one go there, just leave it alone. Well, the climate's still changing around you. So, you know, that's not going to work. So all of these questions, um, I don't want to say they have to be rethought, but they're, they're, everything has a lot of the basic just leave it alone um, thrust of the environmental movement is definitely being challenged. And I myself am a leave it alone environmentalist at heart. You know, I think I, I, I think as much of the planet as possible should be left alone, even though I understand that it's going to, you know, be be changing underneath us. You know, Ed, Ed Wilson, the famous naturalist, has this you know, half earth, a book called half earth, where he talks about we should be setting aside half the earth for other species. Now, that half the earth, you know, I don't see us doing that, but I think it's a good idea. And that half the earth is still going to change owing to climate change, yeah. among other things. Mm. But it would allow creatures to sort of evolve and as many as possible, you know, some of the, some creatures will migrate, some will adapt, you know, some will evolve, uh, and some will drop out. I mean, those are those are all going to happen. But the more space you give them, you know, the more likely it is that they'll get through. Um, but even so, it's impossible to just sort of say, well, we're just leaving things alone. Yeah. I, I read an, uh, an opinion piece today in The Guardian uh, by Aaron Brockovich. It wasn't really an opinion piece. It's a science piece. Uh, about the decrease in sperm uh, production by the human male. And the way she wrote about it is like, this is next to climate change. This is, this is huge. Like 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we could have zero sperm. Well, maybe that will solve our problem. Well, that's Look the, on the bright side. But that's what I thought when I read it at first. I was like, well, would that be such a bad thing if all of a sudden- <laughs> That's why I have so many kids, man. That's that's the whole point. I know. I'm I'm, you know. He does. He's How many like, kids do you have? He's a breeder. Um, By last count, uh, like I want to say 34. I don't know. You literally have four though, right? Five? Four. I literally have four. Yeah. He has four. Yeah. But uh, two of them were mine, but Jessica and I will talk to you about <laughs> It's that a later. long story. We <laughs> don't like to talk about it. It's uh, complicated. Elizabeth, this book has given us so much to think about. Honestly, like, you know, th these ideas were always in the back of my mind, but th but I've never really thought about it in this way. And I mean, I got to be honest with you. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm a disciple. I, I think, yeah, yes, we need to, we need to even... Uh, further manipulate <laughs> our environment and nature. We need to control it even more, despite the fact that it's most definitely going to end in some Gerard Butler movie. Like, that's the guaranteed. We like to end these conversations with what we call the lightning round. If you could, Jurassic World style, bring any one extinct animal back, what would it be? You know, I have a real fondness for the great auk. I'm going to go with the great auk. Oh. So many animals that have the title great in them, and they're not really that great. A great Dane, it's a very good Dane. Well, we don't, we don't, since we, none of us has met a great auk, but you can see them in some natural history museums. They're really beautiful birds. Name something a lot of people like, but you can't stand. <sighs> oh my God. Um, mound spars. <laughs> My wife loves mound bars. I mean, like, why would you eat coconut in a in a candy bar? It makes no sense. Anyway, what's the silliest fear that you have? I have so many fears. It's like fear of fears, fear on top of fears, fears that I don't have, an, that I have too many fears. How's that? Yeah. 
And we shouldn't ask this question of an environmental reporter. That seems like a bad idea. Uh, yeah, seriously, that's unfair. That's unfair. What is one skill you wish you had? Mm, I really wish I could draw. I've been trying to draw and I'm really bad. What emotion do you wish you could control better? Mm, fear. <laughs> yes. Noticing a pattern. Coming back to fear again. Mm -hmm. Describe your soul in 10 words or less. Oh, wow. A seething cauldron. Yeah. <laughs> a seething Thanks. cauldron. That I was love just it. three. Yeah. Wow. I love it. Yeah. That's three is yeah. enough. Yeah. What's something that most people don't know about you? I have to pass on that one because what would anyone know about me? Yeah. I would say, what a fearful person you are. <laughs> no, they know that. <laughs> I read this book. It feels like you're not afraid of anything. Well, my husband says that there are two me's. There's the real me and then there's a me, the reporter. Yeah. And then, and I'm pretty fearless when I'm reporting. But Which one does he like better? Fearful. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> what book has had the greatest impact on your life and why? In a weird sort of way, uh, it was uh, Faust, Goethe's Faust, which led me to learn German, which led me to go to Germany, which led me to become a journalist. So I guess I'd have to say mm. in a really roundabout way that had the biggest impact on me. How do you think you will die? Maybe like um, on an ice floe or something, because I've been to Greenland, to this place where they supposedly let the old people off on the ice floe. And I thought that was actually kind of a good way to go if I could arrange it. Actually, from what I've read, freezing to death is the best way to go. I think so. I think it, it might be. Drowning is supposedly horrible, painful, and horrific because your your lungs think they're breathing. So you're breathing in and out water and you can stay alive for several minutes. Then why, why does everybody say drowning is like peaceful? Is it just a, they're punking us, right? It, they're punking they're us. Daring. They're like, no, it's fine. Go ahead drown. It's fine. What's one eye-opening experience that you think every person should have? I think, and this does bring us back to going off on an ice flow, one experience that I've had that really changed my life was being on top of the Greenland ice sheet. But I can't really recommend that everyone troop to the top of the Greenland ice sheet because I don't think that's a good idea. But in theory, I think that would be a very good experience. I was there last last year um, over by I went to Elulasat and over by Kangaluswak and and took a helicopter up onto the ice sheet. It was it was amazing. And then finally, Elizabeth, what is your life's big question? Yeah, what are we doing here? Elizabeth Colbert, the book is called Under a White Sky. Uh, it is fascinating and frightening and definitely mind altering. Thank you so much for uh, speaking with us on Metaphysical Milkshake. Thank you so much. Thank you, it was fun. Wow, what a fascinating discussion. She's amazing. Uh, what a so brilliant much to think about. mind. Yep. Uh, yeah, so much to unpack there. It's just, it's just fantastic. Um, I mean, I love this idea, like you were saying, in your in your conversation with her about how like the very term environmentalism has to mean something different now right it used to mean preserving nature and now it means like reversing you know the the problems that we've had like we have to we have to manipulate the environment for good yeah it used to be i i don't wear deodorant i like to take hikes i drive an electric car and i recycle mm -hmm. Uh, and now it's got to mean so much more than that. You know, it's going to it's going to mean taking active steps, I think, to manipulate for the positive um, our our living, breathing world in some way. What are you ready to go there, Reza? Are you ready? I think I think I have to like this. Is she, Elizabeth is telling us that what this is what we got to do. We got to manipulate nature, both in our own lives and, of course, on the, on the grand. Scale. What, do you, what are you going to so. do to manipulate nature? Well, um, let's see. I can um, I could figure out how to breed my chickens to babysit my kids. That would be that would be something. Well, that's going to take some genetic modification. You're going to have to use CRISPR to kind of clone little chickens hey. that have uh, the, the 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 smartest chickens. You know. To well, yeah, I'm not going to have a dumb chicken babysit my kids. Rain, Jesus. Of course, I'm. That's I'm going to do the same thing with my pigs. I'm going to. Uh, what's your What's your plan? I'm gonna use CRISPR to have my pigs uh, learn to make me breakfast. What do you think? Is that possible? <laughs> they don't have opposable thumbs 
it might be a problem, but, and I'm not yeah. sure if that's how CRISPR works. You know, I've listened to like 27 podcasts on CRISPR. I still don't really understand what's going on. Well, that's better than me. I've been pretending this entire podcast, like I know what you're talking about, but I actually don't. So, <laughs> As you know, every week we reach out to our audience and say, hey, what do you think? We love your questions. We'd love your comments. We'd like your life's big questions. And in this case, we got a question that is very relevant to the topic at hand. Let's roll the audio tape. I think religion is ever more necessary in the contemporary times. And it's not that we have a dominion over our nature by our choosing, but a uh, God-given um, bounty that um, we can either use or misuse. Um, it's been told um, in Baha'i writings that um, every created thing um, is there for the advancement of human soul. I don't know where that is exactly, but I can, you know, find it. Um, and um, there could be a chance that um, I'm wrong as a person with what I interpret uh, in the world. But uh, such things as divine revelation, uh, meaning the expression of the divine will, uh, is not wrong, and that's how we are able to distinguish between right and wrong. Okay, all right, interesting, interesting. So it sounds like uh, a couple of observations. Sounds like one of my, uh, so I'm a member of the Baha'i faith, one of my Baha'i brothers uh, called in. Thank you very much for the call. One of your sleepier One Baha of my brothers. sleepier Baha'i brothers who was very, very so close to that microphone, I could hear every little detail about how the saliva moved around his mouth. But uh, <laughs> some interesting thoughts in there. It's this whole thing of religion. You, we, we, this is what we talked about this whole time, right? Is that this whole dominion over nature thing starts with this idea that, you know, people who follow a lot of different religions think that somehow that dominion is divinely mandated. He calls it a bounty. Well, I guess I, I would hear it in the opposite way. Like, we we certainly hear in the Old Testament, you know, thou shall have dominion over nature. But what does that mean? Because there's plenty of other religious traditions, you know, monotheistic and otherwise, where humanity is uh, called upon to have a very different relationship with nature than dominion over it. Um, and it, at the end, I think what he was hinting at was like, if nature is an expression of God, if nature is an expression of the divine and the divine will, then we need to live in harmony with that and not try and subdue, control, limit, and uh, and exert our will over it. Maybe I'm reading that into the question, but that's kind of what I got. Like you're, you're Baha'i, is that is that what, what the Baha'i teaching is about? The relationship between humanity and nature? In the Baha'i faith, nature is an expression of God's, of God's will and God's beauty. So we're caretakers, we're not controllers. Um, and there are, you know, prohibitions in the Baha'i faith, for instance, against uh, animals becoming extinct. We should not allow animals to become extinct because they are a creation of God. So anytime you've got some like kind of great giant auk and it's there's no more giant auks on the planet, you know, that that is that is a crime against nature itself. This is a beautiful thing that evolved through the process of evolution. Again, Baha'is believe in the total harmony of science and religion that, you know, God's, you know, igniting creative will through the power of science and evolution created the great auk. And what a tragedy and travesty it is to let a species die in that way. Oh, see, that's interesting. So in, in Islam, it's, a, it's, a, it's slightly different, especially within the Sufi tradition that I follow. It's not so much that nature is created by god it's that nature is god god is in and of himself creation and so anything that exists exists only in so far as it shares in the only thing that exists and so yeah it's not so much dominion it's that you recognize the divinity in nature and then of course you know the correct 
behavior is to treat nature as though it is divine. Yeah. And so obviously that keeps you from exploiting it. So and to treat nature as if it is divine and is as if it is alive. And it mm -hmm. is in so mm -hmm. many ways, depending on how you define life. Thank you, Farzine, Farzen. And uh, next time, just uh, back off the mic a little bit. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> just, a, just a tiny bit. Just a half inch. What about you, dear listener? Do you have any ideas about how to manipulate nature uh, for good as opposed to for bad? Write us. Call us. Talk to us. Call Reza at home. Uh, write us on uh, social at, uh, at Reza Aslan, at Rain Wilson, at Metaphysical Milkshake. Uh, let us know your life's questions, and we might explore them in a future episode. Also, uh, let me know if you're available to babysit. And... Remember to follow, rate, and review Metaphysical Milkshake on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also subscribe to the Metaphysical Milkshake YouTube channel, and then you can watch us have a conversation instead of just Which listen is, to us. Yeah, it's really magical watching us. Uh, otherwise, we will see you next week, assuming there will be a next week. Let's hope. Metaphysical Milkshake is executive produced by Rain Wilson, Reza Aslan, and Colin Thompson. It is produced by Safa Samazadeh Yazd, Harris Lane, Mick DeMaria, Hashem Self, and DJ Lubel. Cast Media is the production and distribution partner. It is edited by Tyler Newbold and audio mixed by Justin Kyle. Original music by Jeff Tang. Reza, I think we need to count our sperm. All right, let's do it. Oh, I thought you meant right now. Oh. That's disgusting.